computer museum in the heart of Silicon Valley, extracting the signal from the noise. It's the Cube, covering OpenStack Silicon Valley 2015, brought to you by Mirantis. Now your hosts, John Furrier and Jeff Brick. Hey, welcome back everyone. We are here live in Silicon Valley where the Cube lives in Palo Alto. This is, we're in Mountain View at the Computer History Museum. It's the Cube, our flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal noise. I'm John Furrier with my co-host Jeff Frick here at the OpenStack Silicon Valley, hashtag OSSV15. Join the conversation. Lou Tucker, CTO, cloud computing at Cisco, legend in the industry. We saw him at OpenStack Summit. Good to see you again. Good to see you guys. Great to be back. Cube alum in the OpenStack. So, okay, cloud yeah. innovation. Yeah. Silicon Valley's innovation. Intel's here, Cisco's here. All the big names are here. Big C chain, big transformation. We've heard that. What's the meat on the bone? Tell yeah. us what's happening. What are you talking well, about? I think, you know, of course, cloud computing, the internet is just continuing to move through different industry after industry. So one of the things I'll be talking about here at, at the summit is that how we've seen, you know, Airbnb is disrupting hospitality, you know, that we've seen um, Netflix disrupting, you know, traditional video delivery. Um, now we're seeing cloud computing going into other areas, such as in terms of network services with large telcos, mobile packet core. A lot of these things are, are changing the whole dynamics where we delivered hardware, you know, for specific system, video encoding, transcoding, video production has always been, for example, hardware based. That's moving to software, and OpenStack is coming in just at that transition. So OpenStack is going to be the platform where all of those innovations start to happen. So I got to ask you, because it says on the, on the website here, um, on, the, on, the, on featuring your thing, it yep. says, quote, changing the face of service delivery. That's the tagline, exactly that's the marketing right. slogan. Okay, you're the CTO. It's not what a marketing hell slogan by any means. <laughs> what does that mean? Very what accurate, does that mean? It's a very accurate statement about <laughs> okay. what's going on it's in the industry. Actual <laughs> marketing, good. That's we right. love, we love the data. Exactly right. What does it mean, that changing that, service delivery? So service delivery in many cases, like I mentioned, has been done by these hardened appliances. If you've seen large, large racks of networking equipment, or if you go into any uh, TV studios, you see large, large racks of transcoders, encoders, all of that big switching things, all of that's being disrupted now. So we're changing how the face, how that is going to be delivered to the customer. We've seen Netflix do that with, with you know, DVRs basically in the cloud. Now we're going to start seeing it hit broadcast video. We're seeing it hit mobile packet core. So cell phone traffic will start running on top, VMs on top of, of OpenStack. So is this a function of performance? Is it a function of stability it's, or both? That's, that's a great question. It's really, it's really both and it's really Moore's Law. Moore's Law, you know, is constantly moving forward here. And in fact, I actually have a machine, we're at the Computer History Museum. I have a machine I had part of the design of called a connection machine. It's one of the dinosaurs downstairs. That <laughs> machine, which was the world's fastest machine for about a year, has been replaced. And Moore's Law continues, and now it actually can be replaced just about by your laptop. Right. It's kind so of like I, when good enough is good enough, right? Because yeah. this, this building used to be, before it was a computer museum, it was a, it was an SGI building, I believe, that's right? That's true, that's true. Or maybe a headquarters that's at some true. point, or that, that was the big one over across the street when they went bananas with that that's headquarters. Right. Uh, so again, specialty boxes, specialty microprocessors, specialty OS and, yeah. and software, which eventually, good enough, got yeah. good enough to displace and, and that. And actually, it's even better than good enough. Because I think that when we see these things move into software, you can upgrade these things instantly. Instead of having a, a truck roll to come out and replace a piece of equipment, you can download a new virtual machine or the containerization of these software services so that you can immediately get this, so you get an acceleration effect from the fact that you move from hardware-based systems to software-based systems. So I got to ask you, you brought up the Computer Museum where one of your original designs was the fastest thing around for a while, got replaced by the next big thing. Mm -hmm. That's Moore's Law, it's totally awesome. That's what clouds bring to the table. Right. But here at the History Museum, there's a Google self-driving car in the lobby, <laughs> which I love to look into because they're driving around, I can't tell if they're taking photos, I say peace, or, <laughs> or is there someone in there? But that really illustrates this new software paradigm yes. because Internet of Things is about the self-driving car. Yes, it's it about real time. So what does that, how does that tie in? Because that's a great example of the kind of innovation we're seeing. Yes. The Internet of Things where it's the wearable watch where I get my tweets and crowd chats to my wrist to self-driving cars need self-healing. They need real-time data. Yes. They need real reliability, not, you know. And they need, and they need this both in the car to, to do the near, term navigation, but then they're also getting all the information from the cloud. 
So they're getting a larger view, and this is where we're seeing, you know, the history of computing has always been actually this between decentralized, distributed computing to centralized things. Now I think what we're seeing is the growth on both sides. So that we're seeing services being delivered from the cloud, in the case of IoT, managing perhaps, you know, sensors, and, and collectors and everything else that are on premise. So we're seeing the union of those two things so that we get the best of cloud computing. So I think that in terms of OpenStack, we're going to see an evolution now of OpenStack whereby OpenStack will start to reach out beyond the data center. And it'll reach out so that you're having management capabilities, yeah. orchestration services. So service delivery is also the full end to end from that user's device across the internet, across multiple data centers, to wherever they're so trying to So is services now going to be genericized, generic in the definition, it could mean any service. So for instance, the mm -hmm. self-driving car will rely on heavy mm -hmm. compute on the device, the yes. car. Yes. It will require cloud delivery of some sort of services, reliability, because you got to be real, real time. You can't be like a half a second. Exactly driving right. a car. No, you have to be responsive. And that's why, just like the human body works that way, we've got sensors and flexors and reactions that are local, even though they're mediated then by by a higher functions that are in the cloud or in our, in our head. The other thing that I love about the self-driving car they, is they published a lot of data recently on, on statistics and information that these things mm -hmm. have collected over whatever, 1.3 million mm -hmm. miles. And it's the second order um, kind of impact where just in the way that they're collecting data to move through the environment, they're now taking a snapshot of that data around them. There was a, and they did a whole thing about bicycles um, because mm -hmm. they're seeing crashes and bicycle behavior that they're not necessarily involved in, but they still can rebuild the scenarios exactly across right. multiple exactly instances right. to yeah. come up with new rules to, in, yeah. in, in, in ways you know, to operate. Yeah. You know, I think the biggest challenge will be us as humans accepting the automation that that brings, because there's a lot of information showing that it'll be much, much safer than having humans drive cars. But then we, we feel very nervous about handing that over to a to a computer system, so fully automated. Is it going to have a steering wheel or not? What if, you know, like we have with airplanes today, which are largely driven on autopilot most of the time, and that a lot of times the problems arise when you actually give humans the ability to, to, to jump in and do something. They often do something wrong. So we have to find the balance, how humans can stay in the loop but we still hand more and more over to the automated. Lou, I love talking to you because you've, again, you've been an inventor, you've been a developer, you've done some things that are even in the History Museum here, so mm -hmm. it's great to mm -hmm. kind of get your mind wrapped around this. But I got to ask you the software question. You know, we hear orchestration, we hear containers. There's so much more work to be done. Mm -hmm. If you think about just concepts of geospatial data, how drones are going to be delivered to unique locations, mm -hmm. to real-time mm -hmm. information on the car, Internet of Things, all this powered by the cloud. Where are we in this? So, How so, early are so, we? I mean, is it a net, is it edge, just anything connected to a network? So one of the things I think that we have to get used to almost is we've talked about continuous integration where we're taking new components, putting in continuous delivery, where we're actually deploying multiple times a day of these new services. We have to talk about continuous learning. This is a challenge for our developer community. There is so much that is happening now and the developers are, I think, having to keep up with now containerization. Containers are great because they make it easier for the application developer. So we will be making more and more tools are continuing to come out. And we're seeing more and more tools then being applied in cloud computing. So that these services, we're talking about microservices, there's other ways to construct applications. So we need to become continuously learning so that we can keep up with all of this oh, innovation. And the devices too, but I want to ask that question on the learning. That kind of implies that if it's moving so fast, and this is a trend that I'm seeing, I haven't fleshed out publicly yeah. yet to yeah. be the first time, is the developer communities themselves are optimizing how they talk to each other, and you see the movement of how fast Docker has risen. Mm -hmm. That kind of teases out this mm -hmm. notion that there's a lot of reliance on each other now as developers Absolutely. more than ever. That, that's great, it's a great point, because I think that we're, particularly we continue to move into the way that applications are being constructed as they are assembling different pieces of different open source pieces of software and services provided by multiple providers. It's an assembly process. This is great, this is what we do in manufacturing plants. This you know, trust though, you know, yeah, a, what's a, the, what's a real manufacturer doesn't build every piece of that component, yeah. they farm that out and they assemble these things. So that's what we're seeing with software now as well, I think. And you got to trust the, your partner. It's almost like being in a, in a cohesive military yep. operation or some yep. sort of yep. team approach because you got to know your partner who's got your back is going is to, have going to be trusted on you, his code. You or need multiple sources of that. You need, there's a lot of things that you need, but it is becoming an assembly. So that will allow us, I think, to build more reliability 
because we can actually have the different components compete for the business of being in that manufacturing pipeline. And the developer's okay. job, job becomes one of assembly and, an, and of architecture. A lot of people look at you as a mentor, certainly with your history and track record in the business. Is there, a, is there an issue that you're pounding the table? Or, you know, hey kids, get off my lawn. I mean, is there a thing that you're so passionate about that you want to share with the folks out there that yeah, you think, can just pass on just a tidbit of sure. like wisdom. I think we're, we're, we're almost in that golden age of development now for application developers. It's a great time to be a developer. The number of tools that we're talking about that are available, the amount of software that's available in open source. You just have a, a plethora of, of, you know, of things that you can use. So I think it's important now for the developer to start taking the user's point of view, where they're trying to develop something for somebody else to use, and they can draw upon this enormous tool set. So it's a great time to be a developer, but it does require continuous learning. You've got to be up on your skills. You've got to take advantage of all of these innovations and not be locked into a single way of looking at it. They have to be able to look at things in, in a much more cohesive, you know. What about the bubble discussion? We were talking to a venture capital earlier, and I would say, you need to comment on whether you think the bubbles, maybe you will or not. But the, for the young generation that haven't lived through multiple cycles of innovation, mm -hmm. what's your advice to them? And I mean, do you give a caution? You throw a caution to the wind, you say, go for broke, break glass, spit well, out nails. The what is your are advice? to financials. I don't see bubbles applying to technology. What we're seeing in technology is a relentless, you know, continuation, like I said, of Moore's Law, of yeah. tools, and then everything else. That's, that's good. So if developers keep true to what their skills really are about, and that is innovation, technology, and everything else like that, they can ride through any bubble that, that may Lou, come what around. about the buyers? I always nice. think of the poor buyers, because they're, they're getting hit with this plethora of options. Everything's getting of, cheaper. And it's getting cheaper, but it's, it's changing so quickly. You know, I just kind of got Hadoop underneath. You're I kind of right, got right, Hadoop right, figured out enough, right. so I got to do Spark. Right. right. Um, I mean, just the, the rate of change, and then you know, with so many options on the open source side, and the and the way those things are growing, from the buyer perspective, he's just trying to you know run his business. It, it, it is it is a lot more difficult. Yeah. I think on on the buying side, and for the you know the CIOs, of large organization having to make these things, I think they have to make bets. You can only you can only succeed if you're willing to make a bet and you stick to it. And you, that's why I think OpenStack right now is getting to be a safer and safer bet. Open source gives us multiple vendors, so that by with OpenStack, you're not dependent upon a single vendor anymore. We you know, have independence of that, you're not being locked in. So the buyers get this freedom when they're going with a platform such as OpenStack. But they got to make that Great bet. comment about innovation, about riding out the bubble, certainly. I totally agree with you. Technologies, underpinnings are being re-architected, so just ride it out, don't get distracted. Um, next thing, networking. Talk mm -hmm. about <laughs> technology innovation. Real quickly, as we end the segment, mm -hmm. you're going to go on panel. Yep. Certainly the services thing we hit on already. What's about what's going on with networking? Where are we? Update, still under well, construction. Yeah, no, Is there no, any it's, progress? It's interesting. The last couple of years, we've seen two big I think sort of things that are coming together this perfect storm. We've seen cloud computing, and we've seen software-defined networking. The, the movement, as we talked earlier about, to software functions instead of, of specialized hardware appliances. Those things are converging now, and we're seeing that called network function virtualization. I think it's really just the virtualization of all these services, whether they be thought of as a network service, or a media service, or a transcoding. This is where it's becoming, because at the end of the day, it's always about networking. We are moving information through our networks from a source of, of content development or video stream out to a user. We're moving in between data centers. So networking is continuing to evolve, I think, as we have these new demands that are coming in. Okay, so I got to ask you the question. I know we're getting the hook here, but I want to get one more mm -hmm. question in. Craig McLucky from Google, we were talking earlier, he made a point that I liked, which was, in talking about API economy, if you if you force the API, API-ification, mm -hmm of the enterprise too early. You could really taint some of the value that mm -hmm. could be created from some of the legacy stuff. So the same mm -hmm. question comes to you around NFV. If mm -hmm. we force NFV or virtualization or SDN too early, Absolutely. is there a foreclosure situation or tainted uh, <laughs> goods? Well, so, people will get burned. And where is the and, hot spots? And, and, and well, I think that you want to, there's a couple of things. Jonathan Bryce actually made a couple of important points at the first in, in kicking it off, which was that you have to have a focus and you pick where there's going to be the highest value in a very simple area that you can succeed in. Build on success. If you take off, if you 
you know, take on more than you can, you can consume, more than you can deliver, you're going to be risking failure. So focus in on the high value teams that are moving fast, that have a very simple objective, and then go behind that success. All right, Lou Tucker, thanks for your time. I know you got a panel. Okay. Good luck with the panel. Great to get you on the front end of that live. It's looking at Lou Tucker. He's got something here in the museum and winning. He was displaced by Moore's Law, but he's here with Cisco doing more. Great to see him on the Cube. Thanks for sharing the data Thank you so and much. wisdom. We'll be right back more live in Silicon Valley here with the Cube after this short break. <laughs>